Okay, good morning. Hope, uh, I hope everyone had a good night, uh, brief though it was, seemed. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I'm sure that, uh, like me, the rest of you all stayed up to watch the uh, Mumbai Indians go 166 for eight and uh, beat uh, Rajasthan, so they're now in first place. Uh, so this is definitely good news. Our uh, uh, session this, uh, this morning uh, is technical opportunities, and we have uh, speakers from uh, DuPont and GE and uh, Reliance. So uh, I'll uh, just go ahead and, and begin. Um, our, first, our first speaker will be uh, uh, Homi Bedwar from uh, DuPont. Uh, Reliance has a long history with DuPont. The first uh, uh, technology we licensed uh, was from DuPont, so our relationship goes back a long way. Uh, Homi runs the uh, Knowledge Center in Hyderabad, uh, and there he heads up all the science uh, and technology uh, for India and the ASEAN countries. Uh, he's been with uh, uh, DuPont since 1977, received his uh, bachelor's degree from IIT uh, uh, Bombay, and a PhD in material science from Carnegie Mellon in the U.S. So, uh, Homi? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> snuck up on me. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, good to see you here. Uh, so I want to start by thanking um, uh, GSAP and Reliance for this great invitation. I had a great uh, day yesterday, uh, chance to hear and listen to uh, a number of people. So um, what I thought I'd do is uh, share with you my experience uh, within and perspectives uh, that I've had over the years with DuPont and give you my view of what I think are these uh, um, uh, emerging technical opportunities uh, uh, in these markets. So um, I just want to say that in the uh, program, it says a DuPont perspective. I just want to make sure that you understand that this is my perspective, uh, colored through the DuPont lens, but uh, it is certainly my perspective. Um, I want to leave you with a few key messages. And the messages really are around the role of science in emerging economies, uh, I want to leave you with a message around how we integrate science overall globally to address challenges, and then talk about how you have to couple science with business models that make it compelling to be in these markets. Science alone doesn't do it. Business models alone without science don't cut it. You need at least that blend, and of course you need the understanding uh, in the marketplace. So those are the, that's going to be the theme of my talk, and uh, I, I hope to elaborate uh, from there. So I'll start with the purpose, and this is very important because my talk is around science. And uh, earlier this year, the DuPont company rephrased or combined its so-called vision and mission statements uh, and called it a purpose. And if you'll see the first sentence in that purpose, is very clear. There's no ambiguity about what DuPont is. DuPont is a science company, period. And every word in this purpose statement has meaning for us. Uh, it's about how we do science. It's about what kind of science we do. And it's about the kind of challenges we, f we want to uh, address. So you'll see that literally every word is very important. The word sustainability, collaboration, innovation, market-driven science, uh, global challenges, these are the areas that we want to focus on as a, as a corporation. So, in July, DuPont will be 211 years old. And 
When Mr. DuPont came from France to the United States, he needed a place where he could start a business in 1802. And, the, and he needed a source of energy for that business. The business was making uh, black powder. And black powder is used in gunpowder and, and other explosives and things of that nature. Very hazardous business and uh, needed a way to mill the powder and all, combine all the ingredients for black powder. The only source of energy in 1802 was water. And so he chose the Brandywine River region in Delaware um, as his first place of work. Uh, the Brandywine River drops about 124 feet in the last five miles. So it was a great source for water power. At that time, the water power was abundant, it was clean, it was free. And from that time on, the DuPont Company has been in pursuit of those kinds of energy sources, abundant, renewable, clean and, and free. So these are challenges we've had from the very start. Now in 1802, there were less than a billion people on this planet. In 2011, there were seven billion, and in 2050, there will be nine billion. So we're going to have some enormous challenges as we deal with this kind of uh, explosion and population on this very fragile Earth, planet of ours. And so we have decided that these major global challenges with this kind of scenario are going to be around how do we feed nine billion people? How do we provide energy or reduce our dependence on fossil fuel, these nine billion people? And how do we protect them and the environment? So these are the three megatrends that DuPont is addressing. And all our science and all our activities are around addressing these megatrends. Now, these are global megatrends, but they're probably even more important in emerging markets because a lot of that population is going to happen here in this part of the world. And so the megatrends are global, but they have very specific issues and, and challenges in the um, emerging markets. And as you will see, and as we kind of talked about yesterday, uh, there is a little bit of dependence between feeding people and the energy issues. So in many ways, some of these megatrends are going to kind of work together uh, as we do this. Now, these challenges are huge. And it's very clear that to meet these challenges, no one company, no one entity can address them by themselves. And so we have this concept around what we call the global collaboratory. The global collaboratory is a way in which we include a variety of stakeholders to address these, these challenges. And so they can be the government, they can be academia, they can be NGOs, they can be potentially competitors. And our organizations that actually can help address these challenges. So the whole concept of collaboration is now very key and very integral to the way DuPont works. Because no, because we can accomplish together that no one can do by ourselves. 
Now, we are putting our money where our mouth is, and we have, uh, last year we spent $2 billion in R&D. You'll see 86% of that money uh, is around these three megatrends. And you could see we spend over a quarter of a billion dollars on energy. That's a lot of money. And a lot of our effort goes into addressing these uh, megatrends. I said we are a science company. As far as I'm concerned, this chart tells you what the DuPont company is all about. So what we have, what we are showing here is that there is a combination of science disciplines. On my left uh, is the cells in green, which are our biology competencies. And in the middle and on the right are our capabilities and core competencies in chemistry and material science. We build, this, we build these competencies on a platform of engineering, analytical science, regulatory science, modeling, application development, and so on. This is who we are. Now, each competency has rich and deep capability within the DuPont company. So we're not talking about two and five people addressing these competencies. We're talking about hundreds of people all over the world. Uh, in many cases, world-class scientists known for their contributions to the world in some of these competencies. And what we do now is to use these competencies in different ways to address the megatrends that I talked about. And I want to give you some examples of how we do that and how we could do that in emerging markets. But before that, I, I want to share with you that we have laboratories all over the world. And uh, one of our recent laboratories is the one in India, in Hyderabad. Although it looks as if Hyderabad is the center of the universe, uh, that's not quite true. Uh, we collaborate, uh, uh, and if, if you showed any one of those laboratories, they would, in fact, have the same kind of uh, set of communications. So we not only communicate amongst ourselves, uh, but we also communicate, uh, also have our customers talk to and work with uh, the experts in the field. So if an expert uh, in, um, uh, let's say, enzymology happened to be in Palo Alto, and if he or she is awake at the time, our customer is awake in India, we can actually have live video sessions. And so we bring the customer a unique capability where they can address. It doesn't, the, the expert doesn't have to be local. It can be anywhere in the world. Uh, and, and can start meeting those needs. We also have innovation centers, uh, one in Pune uh, and one in Bangkok. Um, we have six others in Asia Pacific and a total of 11 all around the world. And these innovation centers are portals where uh, customers can come, talk, and see uh, our products and then communicate with, uh, as I said, these experts all over the world. So this is the center in Hyderabad um, that we built in uh, November of 2008. Um, I came here to do that and run the center. And so that was now, I, I came here in October of 2006 and uh, we built the center in, uh, we had the center ready and working in 2008. And uh, we are now uh, uh, close to uh, over 400 scientists and engineers. Uh, we recruit from all over the world. Uh, 
hundreds of PhDs and, and research support. Um, we currently have uh, this on a 25-acre campus, so what you're seeing is just a small snapshot of uh, where we are, and we are constantly growing. And uh, from the energy standpoint, this facility was LEED certified, L-E-D, uh, Leadership in Engineering and Environmental Design, and it's a silver certified building, or buildings, the whole campus is, is silver certified, and we are working on getting gold uh, based on our operational efficiency on the campus. So I talked about the vision we had when our founder came to this country and used water power, which was clean, abundant, renewable, and free. And over the past 210 years, we continue to search for those opportunities. So DuPont has um, capabilities in photovoltaics, in biofuels, in, in, in substituting materials uh, or lightweighting automobiles for fuel efficiency, wind energy, and building efficiencies or efficient buildings. And if you recall our dinner speaker last night, he mentioned some of these, in fact, all of these, I was knocking them off my list as he was speaking, uh, are relevant to India of some kind or another. And so I think it's very critical that we now have that capability, we have global capability to address the very important energy challenges uh, certainly of India, and I would say of in, in emerging markets. So the question really is, how do we create and bring these technologies into the mainstream? And that is what we are trying to do, is bring these technologies into the mainstream. So I'll give you examples of the three on my left. Uh, and uh, these are all relevant here in emerging markets. So as far as uh, solar energy is concerned, and time doesn't permit me to get into a lot of detail, but DuPont uh, materials are in about half of the modules, solar modules, that have been made since 1975. We do not make, or we do not manufacture silicon, but we manufacture everything else that goes into a photo, uh, photo voltaic module, be it conductors, uh, be it encapsulants, back sheets, front sheets, frames, and a whole bunch of other uh, accessories. And so our goal, and here notice the competencies that are used to, in fact, address these photovoltaic issues. And so one of the things we're doing is making the cost of modules and cells cheaper. So how is that? One of our products is thick film paste. This happens to be these silver lines that you see, the grid that you see on, on the module. DuPont thick film paste have allowed efficiencies to increase not the only contributor, but a very large contributor, uh, uh, efficiencies to increase from 12% a decade ago to where they are today. Um, we also have materials for back sheets and, and uh, encapsulants. Uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Clemens uh, talked about the uh, levelized cost of electricity. And he showed this particular equation, which includes the cost of the cell, the cost of the balance of the system, cost of installation, and uh, with a denominator around efficiency and um, lifetime of the system, right? So anything you can do to increase the denominator reduces the cost of the system, 
uh, levelized cost of electricity. And so we have the pace that impact efficiencies, and we have uh, the encapsulants and, and uh, back sheets uh, that allow us to uh, increase the life, and we can guarantee life for 25 years. So when people say, how much is the cost of a, mo of a cell or a module, I think it's important to understand this entire system and how it works, and in the long run, what is going to be economical. Another example I want to share with you is the work in cellulosic ethanol. And as you heard, uh, there are a lot of challenges around how you actually uh, get this to market because there are a number of pieces that have to be in place in order for this kind of uh, uh, system to be, uh, to be uh, viable. And so you see here some of the competencies that we use to address the biofuels space. And the work in DuPont started uh, almost 20 years ago when we started to hire our first biologist into the company. And I almost remember those days because there's this poor person coming in a, in a corporation of chemists and material scientists and didn't know uh, where, uh, where, where, what he should be doing. But since then, we have developed uh, a strong biology capability. But it's done through collaboration. So we didn't have this to begin with but other organizations and companies did. So we worked with the Department of Energy to set up consortia where we in fact brought, and, and, the, and the Department of Energy brought in certain corporations that could impact uh, the creation of an integrated corn biorefinery. So I have some of the names, they're not all of them here, but the point I want to make here is that when you do not have the capability, you need to be able to collaborate and bring others into the fold. And so at this point, we can actually go from one end to the other um, uh, in um, cellulosic ethanol. Three years, uh, three years ago, we had a demonstration facility in Venor, Tennessee, where we have been generating data for all of these stages that you see here. And getting data for a commercial facility, uh, and we broke ground uh, last November uh, in uh, Nevada, Iowa. So it's not in Nevada, but it's in Iowa. It's the city of Nevada in Iowa. And uh, that facility, uh, will be operational in mid-2014, uh, at which point we will uh, be generating uh, 30 million gallons per year of biofuel, cellulosic ethanol, ethanol from uh, cellulose sources. That will make us, I believe, the first and largest capability in the world with uh, a full demonstration of cellulosic ethanol. Now, some of these things happen uh, because, uh, and I, I bring, uh, I, I highlight a particular point here, and I've shown here a block that shows this thing called accelerase. Accelerase is an enzyme that at one point, uh, that was an area that we needed filled as far as DuPont competencies were concerned. And a company uh, called Genencore, happened to be in Palo Alto, uh, was a partner in the early uh, consortia stages. And we worked with Genencore over the years, and we decided that they were just a wonderful place, so we bought that company. Actually, we bought the parent uh, in 2011, that was Denisco, and Genencore is a subsidiary of Denisco. 
So now, in addition to our uh, enzyme capability, we also have some nutrition and health capability that Denisco brings. And this enzyme uh, is, uh, allows us to do a variety of different things. It's optimized uh, for cellulosic feedstock, cellulosic feedstock. Uh, it, it works on uh, C5, C6 uh, sugar conversion. It, um, and it's fast. And uh, it can work with a variety of feedstock. So it can work with wood chips, paper, uh, sugarcane bagasse, municipal solid waste, a variety of things. And we were talking earlier is whether we can put all of these things in one hopper and away it goes. And that is clearly the holy grail uh, of what you want to do. But, but this is uh, the, the thing that we need. So the point I want to make here is that integrated science coupled with collaboration can also help you solve uh, many of these challenges. And finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, fuel efficiency. And that is around light weighting of cars and how we do that. And we use these kinds of capabilities to address light weighting. And so, what does light weighting mean? It really is substituting metal with polymers in various parts of the automobile. So, it can be structurally, it can be component-wise, and you see some of the examples, I certainly don't want to go through all of them, but see some of the examples where we've substituted metal components with polymers. And for every 11 kilograms that you can lighten, uh, you save uh, you save barrels of, uh, of of fuel. So coming to our point around emerging markets, so I wanted to set the stage around global science collaboration integration, and now apply this capability to some of the challenges we have here. So when we talk about emerging markets, we have to look at it holistically. There are clearly uh, the challenges in our rural markets, the urban, rural, poor, but there are also challenges with the urban middle class. And the middle class in this country is growing tremendously. And so what we have to be doing is looking at it holistically in an emerging market, looking at all of these areas and addressing the challenges. So the main thing that keeps coming up is around affordability. And so all of these solutions need to be affordable and they need to be customized uh, for the specific needs in the marketplace. And um, many of uh, the speakers yesterday talked about understanding the need of the customer. And so, from an energy standpoint, India has renewables, it has uh, uh, the fossil fuels, and on here you'll see some of the challenges in the energy markets. There's power deficits, there are transmission losses, there's an over-dependence on fossil fuel, uh, and different demands during the day uh, and night in terms of supply and demand. Huge, huge uh, uh, challenges. So one of the things we do as trying to understand the needs of the marketplace is a few years ago, a team of Duponers uh, broke up and went to various parts of uh, India, just as you did, uh, just as the Stanford team did uh, a few days ago, and, and really tried to immerse and understand some of these challenges. And here is an example, for instance, of a village in Jhansi, uh, which is off the grid, uh, and, and, and this village actually has 24-7 electricity. So how did that happen? Well, uh, a corporation donated uh, a grid uh, and set it up and, and distributed the power. And, and they actually even meter the power to individual households. So you can actually, each household gets a little bill and they pay based on the electricity they used. 
but the initial cost and the capital were a charitable contribution. So the question, I think, is, is this a sustainable model? And probably not, because we just don't have, at this, in this particular case, a way to do that. And so yesterday we heard the gentleman from uh, Meragao Power talk about a grid sys mini grid system and, and how he looks at his company. There are many other examples. I have one here uh, of a corporation, a uh, company called Gram Power. Some of you may have heard of them. Uh, so I want to make sure this is not an endorsement of Gram, uh, Gram Power. Uh, we don't know much about them. I just thought it was an interesting looking model which probably needs to be continued to be improved and looked at. But they have a way of actually getting that initial, paying for that initial capital, and then through a fairly secure system, uh, getting the money back to them in a relatively efficient way. And so it's going to need models like this uh, that um, are going to uh, be able to be used. But even a model like this needs to be scaled up. And one of our uh, speakers yesterday, I believe it was uh, Dr. Barnhart, is it? I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Uh, talked about the combination of, of uh, energy generation, PV combined with wind, and, and, and are these sustainable? And then do you need to have a storage solution uh, with uh, PV. And so, you know, I, I thought the Prussian blue was an interesting uh, way, uh, material to store. So is this concept scalable? And therefore, uh, do we need another element like energy storage to be part of this kind of model? Again, more food for thought rather than endorsing one or the other. But it's going to mean that the science is there pretty much for emerging markets. Now, I'm not advocating we don't do science in emerging markets. Please make sure you know, I, uh, you, uh, I, I make that very clear. The point is that for current solutions, the science exists. By and large, it exists. We need to couple it with interesting ways to get it into the marketplace. And so a model like this is something that we are really uh, driving. And so we look at one end where we try to understand customer and market needs in the markets. We use technology uh, to address those needs using collaborations to get the technology and then using uh, innovative business models to, to couple it. So that is really what I'm trying to, to, to get across. This is really what I started with earlier and um, I want to thank you. Homie, thank you. Very uh, excellent uh, talk. Uh, some stimulating questions. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, Bruce. You started with water as energy, and it seems like water is increasingly important, but it's not listed as one of your three megatrends. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. And also, while I have the microphone, uh, <laughs> On the cellulosic, cellul cellulosic ethanol, are you at energy break even, or how, what is your return on energy in that? So let me answer that one first. So obviously the fact we've gone through now all the uh, steps in commercialization, we've looked at the business model, the, sustainable, the sustainability of the business model, and the economics. And we believe that this is a very doable solution. But you need to get all the pieces right. It's, uh, it, you can't do it in just, just, just addressing one piece of this whole thing. There's a whole supply chain. There are various aspects to making sure this happens location-wise and a variety of things like that. Uh, the first question around water. This is something that the DuPont Company has looked at uh, many, many times in its history. And we continue to look at that. Um, we think it's very important. Uh, we just have to figure out what competencies we bring 
to the water uh, uh, challenge and whether this is best handled by others or whether there's something unique we bring to the party. It's very important when you address these challenges to make sure that you have the capability and capacity to do something about it. Uh, otherwise, it just doesn't make sense. So, excellent question. I'm looking at water in India as, as an opportunity. Let's see where we come. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anything else? Homi, this is Prashant here from GE. Uh, one question on the same topic. Uh, what is the efficiencies of this conversion of uh, cellulose ethanol? And, uh, and how much ton I need? How much ton gets converted into ethanol? And how does it work? I can talk about all this offline because there's a lot of uh, information that's even available on our websites. So I would ask you to go and have a look at those and uh, see the information we have there. Uh, the, the, the whole uh, business model and, and, uh, and the approaches are well documented. So it'll take up a time if I yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Another question? Okay. Homie, thank you very much.